the Neolithic Revolution and the Rise of Civilization. The objectives are, one, discuss the changes that occurred during the Neolithic Revolution that made the development of cities possible, and second, identify the major economic, political, and social changes for early humans brought about by systematic agriculture. So last we left off, we were talking about the Paleolithic um, man and, and his attempt to master his environment through manipulating various resources, particularly fire. Um, but we end up seeing a shift into um, a agricultural-based society, no longer nomadic after the last ice age, somewhere around 8,000 BCE. And this phase is known as Neolithic re the Revolution, that is, the new Neolithic stone, the new Stone Age. And really, this is uh, characterized by that shift from hunting and gathering nomadic lifestyle to uh, sedentary, settled, systematic agriculture. And really, this is also distinguished by, at the same time, uh, domestication of animals uh, for human use. Um, and so that dis domestication is really that adaptation of animals for human use. You could see um, this with wolves to dogs, wild sheep and goats to domesticated uh, sheep and goats and so forth. And of course, the, these animals are used for meat sources, um, milk, wool, uh, any of those sorts of, of um, features that they would normally use them for, except for the milk. I mean, many of the hunters um, out when they're hunting are chasing down these animals for their meat and so forth. Um, but, but they get the idea that um, this would be a lot easier if we took them back with us and just waited for them to have babies and and raise them and then we can eat them. Um, same thing with crops. Why are we going all the way out here to gather this when, you know what, it looks like these seeds, uh, when you put them in the ground, they grow. So why don't we bring those closer to our our, uh, our huts? And then inevitably it just get they get the idea, you know, we don't have to move on. We can stay here. And so this is a, a massive revolution. It's a shift in the way that humans lived. And so it is a real true revolution. So the Neolithic Revolution, it was um, based on the acquiring of food on a regular basis, and it gave humans greater control of the environment, much more than the manipulation of fire, perhaps. Um, certainly on par with the first uh, tools fashioned, um, is this domestication of animals and systematic agriculture. And, and so this really emerged somewhere between 8,000 and 5,000 BC um, all over the globe. And it's really hard to see if it started in any particular place, um, but it seems that it, it really spread um, on its own um, in, dis in different locations. Yes, in certain regions it spread from one area to the next, um, but, but it seems that independently this concept um, emerged um, in this same time period globally from different communities. Now, we end up seeing various communities really taking hold of this. The growth of crops on a regular basis gave, of course, rise to permanent settlements. Um, and inevitably, of course, as you can imagine, uh, this didn't demand that nomadic groups split off. Early on, nomadic groups, um, due to the availability of resources, needed to stay small um, because a, a particular region couldn't necessarily support all those people. And so um, when you have domestication of, of uh, animals and you have the, the um, agriculture, um, there's no really um, a huge push to split apart so they can gather together and stay together. And we'll see this in a few places early on. I mean, the oldest and biggest in Southwest Asia is Jericho in Palestine, um, which has a mythic history, um, particularly if you read the narratives of the biblical text. However, um, here for our uh, purposes, I want to zone in on um, Katal Huyuk. I want to focus on that. Um, Katal Huyuk is located in modern Turkey and was uh, even larger um, than Jericho with 32 enclosed acres, somewhere from 6,700 to 5,700 BCE. That roughly about a thousand years that this city uh, kind of rose and dominated the region. Um, it was uh, made of mud brick, 
Um, and so the homes were made of mud, um, and they were built closely to one another, quite haphazardly, um, really out of use rather than uh, planning. Um, you had domesticated animals, crops, and so forth. Uh, so artists have really attempted to illustrate what this might look like here, I think, is a good depiction. Um, we can see a river running along here, quite necessary for a settlement, not only just for water resource, but for um, things like transportation, um, waste disposal. I mean, it's a big issue when you got a lot of people living together. Where's the bathroom? Um, you got fields off in the in the distance. Um, you have your domesticated animals here on the forefront. Um, but what I love is kind of the uh, jigsawed sort of haphazard growth that you can see here. Why? Because it grows out of necessity, not planning. Uh, people might say, hey, you know, Uncle Joe's coming to live with us, so let's build on an attachment. And so for thousands of years, you have people, you know, doing this hundreds of years. And so obviously it's going to take a while, um, but this is kind of developing what you would see. Now, of course, by having people settle all together and through the domestication of animals, you, you no longer have the sort of uh, hunter-gatherer um, lifestyle where everyone hunts and everyone gathers. Um, now it results in surplus. And with surplus, not everyone has to hunt. Not everyone has to raise um, crops. Not everyone has to raise uh, the animals. And so this leads to specialization of labor. Um, and we see this in the development of artisans, uh, people who specialized in the skills of fashioning new objects, weapons, jewelry, um, stone statues, um, and anything that someone was really good at. Um, we see them shift into that role permanently, which is kind of a natural thing. I mean, people say, hey, uh, that guy was always the best at making awesome spears, so we'll just have him make awesome spears for everybody. Um, now, one, one of the, the specializations that occurs is, is a, a religious office. Um, now, of course, religion is going to look a lot different than, um, than our modern sort of shapings of religion. Um, it's going to be more uh, animistic, spiritual, um, and so it's connected to nature. And um, so really the term we're looking for here is a shaman. Um, so you had shamans, um, priestesses. Um, connecting earth and, and the divine. Um, and, and most often these people worshipped female uh, goddesses. Uh, and we, we know this because we can see some of the statues that they left behind. Here's a great depiction of, of a female goddess, um, kind of a, a mother goddess or earth goddess. Um, usually we believe associated with birth, nursing, fertility, um, abundance. Um, why? First... A characteristic consistently throughout all these statues is uh, a large woman, and she has um, engorged breasts. That is usually a major feature. Why? The idea is uh, the kind of nursing or caring or feeding, um, which if you depict yourself as, as children wanting to be nursed or cared for by Mother Earth, um, it's, a, it's an interesting imagery um, that's, a, that's a connected there. Um, also, the, the plentifulness, um, hence why this um, idealized image here is, is quite large. Um, and she, it means she's got plenty of resources. I mean, particularly in a society where uh, you're struggling hand to mouth. When you're going to get the next meal? Is it going to be enough? Um, looking up to having plenty in this sort of sense was an ideal and really an ideal beauty as well. Um, and then fertility, of course, um, to health. And you would turn to Mother Goddess for all sorts of help. I mean, here is an interesting case. If you look on the screen, you see the, uh, the bear cave drawing. I mean, this was etched into the side of a cave, and it's an etching of a bear, probably a bear that, that um, kind of haunted a village and so they invoked the aid of the mother goddess. And so we kind of see slash marks as if some kind of spell was conducted or some invocation. Um, almost as if they're stabbing the image of the bear. Um, to stab the image of um, the bear might mean that, that the bear itself would, um, would die. This, this anthropologically is referred to as um, sympathetic magic. 
Um, and of course, you can see the blood spewing out of this bear's mouth. So, um, and, and bears were were serious uh, were serious enemies in this uh, in this time. I mean, you would have to face this off with knife in hand. So, so a serious issue that that was worthy of of invoking the mother goddess for assistance. Now, some of the consequences of the Neolithic Revolution are beyond just specialization of labor on an individual scale, and we start seeing whole communities organize themselves around specialization. Um, organized communities, of course, stored food and material goods, and this, of course, led to trade. And certain cities, certain towns, certain regions specialized in certain things. They had things. So obviously, if you're near a river, you might have a lot of fish. Um, you're near some kind of copper mine, you might have a lot of copper. You might a lot of have whatever, right? Any whatever resource that you're good at. And this would lead to um, people wanting to trade with you for the thing that you have. And so the trading of goods caused people to begin to specialize in those certain crafts. And even a, um, so a city sort of level, inter-regional specialization of love, love labor, where it led to interconnectedness through trade. Um, and you could see this on huge scales, um, even between Africa and India early on. Um, so the systematic um, agriculture and this shift um, also led to massive shifts and consequences for the role of women and gender roles as well. I mean, if you remember during the Paleolithic Age, um, during the hunter-gatherer, there was no real need for a uh, defined, solidified kind of uh, gender roles. Uh, because the as long as you didn't have a kid, it didn't matter. I mean, if you had if you had no kid and you were great at hunting, hey, come on the hunt with us, right? If, if you were a great forager um, and you weren't super um, athletic, I mean, who cares? Great, um, foraging is, is just as important. It's kind of a almost an egalitarian approach. Um, but eventually, what we end up seeing is that as people settled, uh, women were no longer required for the daily um, subsistence living that is planting and uh, and and hunting and things like that now that's to say women of course were involved um, but we end up seeing uh, that m that people tended to specialize in their labor right this was a trend and so uh, it became seen as women specializing in the labor that, that only they could do, which was take care of the children. And this eventually became attached to the concept of the home because you're no longer nomadic. And so this is really the seeds of um, women staying at home and men um, kind of providing. And so um, these gender roles really have their origin this far back. Now, the end of the Neolithic Age is really traced toward uh, the shift away from the manipulation of stone and toward the manipulation of metals. So the use of metals marked really that new level of control over the environment. You, um, you began to see the heating of metal-bearing rocks um, down to a liquid state. How this would be done was um, through this method here on the screen. You can see the, the image um, where uh, these stones are, are placed in a kind of a kiln fire and the the person is blowing air into it to stoke it to heat it and it's you can see some of this quasi molten metal is is sitting in this kind of gigantic spoon there um, melted down enough to be uh, molded and shaped which is the the person doing next to next to him right he's flattening out this metal um, probably too hot to not wear gloves there, but um, the idea is that th these people are beginning to manipulate on a new level um, the stones, getting down to the uh, the harder elements within them, the the metals. And now the the first initial uh, metal that starts to crop up and emerge, and it's during the Neolithic Age, it's a transitional period, um, was copper. Um, copper is soft material and um, was in relative. Uh, scarcity, but some regions were, were well um, supplied with it. And you also end up seeing tin as well. Um, but really, it's after 4000 BCE that we end up seeing uh, the genius idea of combining both molten um, copper and tin to form bronze, which leads to a new age of metalworking known as the Bronze Age from 3000 to 1200 BCE. 
um, and inevitably then the Iron Age in 1000 BCE. Now, of course, this, this all begs a question that we need to kind of talk about before we end this session, and that is, what in the world is civilization? I mean, we can kind of see um, civilization arising as people are settling, building um, networks, building trade networks, building complex um, governance systems. Uh, so a civilization technically is a complex culture in which large numbers of human beings share a, uh, a number of common elements. And, and these elements are typically cities, they're living in cities, um, that they have a complex hierarchical government, they have religion, they have a social structure, writing, and art. So uh, really, technically, any, any group of people that doesn't have these features is not considered a civilization. Uh, they're, uh, a, they're, they're people, they're, they're a culture, no question. But initially in the conception of civilization, it was meant to distinguish between someone like the Egyptians and just some nomadic tribe in Syria. So that was that was kind of the the idea that um, you see a new complexity that began to emerge um, and and characterized by this term. Now it's unfortunate though because it, it started to gain uh, some political and social meaning beyond just the technical historical term. Uh, when we start calling someone uncivilized, what that technically mean is means is that they aren't in a city, don't have a government. Uh, maybe don't have religion or writing or so forth, but it carries a kind of weightiness of of saying you're you're sort of barbaric, uncivilized. Um, so um, people, particularly historians, have really started to move away from the term civilization. But I think it's still important that we we learn what technically it means in a historic context. So really with the rise of cities, governments, the role of religion, um, we're really seeing and exploring uh, the initial civilizations, which we'll go into detail later, um, Egyptians and Mesopotamians and so forth. Now, the first civilizations, of course, developed along river valleys. Um, you, you need um, water source and abundance if you're going to build a civilization. And so um, some of the famous civilizations early on are along rivers, the Indus River Valley civilization, Mesopotamian civilization, uh, the Egyptian civilization, all along major rivers. Um, now, governments grew out of necessity, of course, to organize and regulate human activity. Um, you need clear governance when you start having hundreds, if not thousands, of people living in one space. And, of course, you had a priestly sort of uh, duty as well, where they supervised rituals aimed at pleasing the gods. Um, and, um, of course, associated with pleasing the, uh, the leaders, and there was a, a, a kind of a connection between the priests and the and the kingship, where the kings and, and kingship governance would uh, would be bolstered by the religious um, uses and the religious, uh, even in some sense, propaganda for the gods um, condoning or even supporting of these people kind of running things. And, and so the idea would be that people then should listen to them. Um, so, we'll, of course, we'll get into specifics when we get into civilizations um, in particular. But um, really, one of the most important things that we need to highlight here is the is the development of the use of writing. Um, so, of course, with abundant food supplies, you, you know, there was all kinds of new opportunities that were created. And this, of course, enabled lots of people to leave um, farming and to shift into new um, activities. And um, as, as urban populations um, kind of exported finished goods to their neighbors um, and exchanged them for raw materials. Really, we see that trade system really growing, but but at the core of it, you still need, in an economic sense, to kind of start to record what's being traded, what's being exchanged hands. How do I keep records of this? I mean, these are really the seeds of writing. And so um, from primitive tally marks all the way to complex writing, that's really where this this grows. Um, and, and really, above all, rulers, priests, merchants, artisans, they, they end up using um, this method of recording um, for their own purposes. Obviously, kingship, you need to kind of keep track of taxes and people, um, priests, some kind of supernatural, mystical connection between them and the gods. We'll see this um, in China, for example, in their attempt to communicate to the divine through, uh, through bone oracles. 
so, so this becomes a, a quite um, consistent trend across the globe. Our objectives were, one, discuss the changes that occurred during the Neolithic Revolution that made the development of cities possible. And second, identify the major economic, political, and social changes uh, for early humans brought about by systematic agriculture.